going to read from Luke, where it's from, the line that I'm going to be speaking on. And it's Luke uh, 24, or 23, 34. Um, and just before that, 33 says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So to start with, when Jesus said, Father, he said, Father, forgive them. So anybody standing around would know he wasn't just speaking into the air, he was speaking to his Father. And only a son can call somebody Father. And back in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, I'm just going to read that. It just says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So anybody around there would know, as Jesus cried out to his father, that God, he was the son of God. Um, now, going on here, Jesus, as the high priest, he has already atoned for our sin. And when he said, forgive, because it's the high priest every year in the temple that would go to make atonement for the sins of the people. And even on the cross, before Jesus gave up his spirit to his Father in heaven, he was interceding for us. Even with his dying breaths, he was saying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's not just for the people that were there that day, but it's for all of the mankind that, would, that was born before and that came after. When I was walking in sin, when I didn't know the Lord, he still forgave me. That it was already done, the work was already done. My part was just to repent, and my part was just to hear the good news. And how can I hear it if nobody tells me? Well, somebody did tell me, hallelujah. They carried out the Great Commission, and today I can stand and say I'm saved, and I can tell others now. So forgiveness is a huge thing. Um, and many times we find that people say it's hard to forgive, but you know what? It's really not. It's a choice. It's a choice because your mind is always going to tell you and bring up reasons why you shouldn't forgive, but that's the enemy. And many times when we're hurt by other people, uh, maybe really bad things do happen and we find it hard to forgive. That vessel has been used by the enemy. You know, they don't, that person doesn't even really know what they're doing. If they did, they wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So our forgiveness really sets them free. Just as God's forgiveness for us set us free. When we forgive somebody else, it breaks the hold of Satan over their lives and our lives because Satan can only work what's common to man, the Bible says. And what is common to man? But hatred, um, violence, um, anger, but boy, once we do what the commandment of God says and we choose to forgive, that hold is broken. Satan's lost whatever game plan he had, and that's a good thing. Hallelujah. Now, um, the forgiveness of God has set us free, and we, when we forgive others, it actually it, we receive healing, and they do as well, actually. The, the enemy cannot use them, and, uh, and we can pray for them. Um, it's an extension of God's forgiveness. He now dwells in us, and we're told we're commanded to forgive because he's forgiven us. My goodness, he went to the cross and paid a high price to forgive us our sins, so we should be making the right choice in forgiving others. Um, and it's just by walking in the flesh that we may find ourselves not wanting to forgive or finding it hard to forgive, but we're called to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh to fulfill the lust of the flesh, but walk in the spirit. And it is a choice. Peace is tied to forgiveness. We would not know the peace of God if we didn't have the forgiveness of God. But we can know the peace of God because he has forgiven us and he's made a way through the blood of Jesus. Now, as I was studying about this and and knowing what I was going to speak on, one thing seemed to lead to another, and another, and another. And when Jesus was on the cross, he not only saw the joy that was set before him, all of the masses of people that were going to be born, but he also saw directly in front of him the people who were there at the time, which were the Jews and the Romans. The Jews um, had sent him to the cross. The Romans nailed him to the cross. He saw Jew and Gentile, and he died for both. He died for everybody. Um, 
and why I'm, I'm getting on to this, God has really put on my heart. And he reminded me years ago when I was starting to, the Holy Spirit, I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I was praying in tongues and sometimes my mind would say, that's just you, that, that's, not, that, 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 that's not you, that's just, that's just noise you're making, you know, that's, that's not really you. But I went to a, a prayer meeting at the church I was going to at that time and um, while I was there I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to listen to those, I, I'm just going to pray as God leads me and I prayed in tongues and there was an interpretation and one of the first things that was interpreted was that Israel is blameless. God had been working in my heart just just revealing things to me about the Jewishness of Jesus, about Israel, the part Israel plays in world events today, and uh, God's love for his chosen people. Isaiah, I think it's in Isaiah, says that God is married to Israel, so we need to be praying for the Jewish people and understanding that at the time that Jesus was crucified, when people say the Jews killed Christ, you know what? They did, but they were supposed to. That was their assignment. They were called for such a time as that. They were called to show who the one true God is to the world, and they had to carry out the sacrifice, sacrificing the lamb who was going to be atoning for the sins of the people. Now, they did it every year with a, a perfect lamb that was raised, and they would do it every year to atone for the sins of the people, the high priest would, in the temple. And that covered the sins of the people for one year. But it was prophesied that there was coming a Messiah, another, a Lamb of God, who would atone for the sins of the world forever. And they had practiced it and rehearsed it over and over and over, so that when the time came, they had to do it. They didn't know. So when Jesus said, forgive them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, they really didn't know what they were doing. Even today, um, when the, the Feast of the Lord, uh, the different feasts uh, during the year that the Jewish people celebrate, they can't see Messiah in it. They're doing it. They're doing what God told them to do. They had to do it. And praise God, God, uh, Jesus himself said in John 10, he said, I lay down my life. Nobody takes it. I have power to take it, to lay it down and to take it up again. So they just did what they were supposed to do. And, <laughs> and we need to be blessing the Jewish people and praying for their salvation, praying for God's protection over them. Jesus came in the fullness of time. He came when God knew that he would be rejected because he was supposed to be rejected. He had to lay down his life. That's why he came. And, and at that time, yes, he wasn't received by the, by the religious Jews. They, they didn't see. But afterwards, when we read in Acts 2, the second book of Acts, I'm just going to read from there. Now, this is after the disciples, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were empowered to go and preach the gospel. And it says, let's see, I'm going to start. It's a long chapter. <laughs> but, um, so Peter is preaching. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew this was going to happen. Jesus knew it was going to happen. Um, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of. And it goes on here. And then the people are saying that when they heard this, it says that they were, they were pricked in their hearts. They were, they were just torn. They were so upset. That the, and they said unto Peter and to the, to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do? What can we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it goes on. So afterwards, they did. The many, many believers, one in six were believers at that time. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go on here. Um, you know, Jesus was, uh, they were on assignment. Jesus laid his life down in the fullness of times. Um, and Jesus laid his life down for the sheep, for his sheep. And that, that they had, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, it says uh, when Jesus, they put Jesus on the cross, nine o'clock in the morning was when the high priest was binding the lamb that they were going to sacrifice to the horns of the altar in the temple. 
at that same time Jesus was being tied to the cross. Everything had to be in order. Everything had to be exactly as God had told them to practice and rehearse over and over and over. And you know, um, there are, Jesus had spoken to them before and told them, you know, you know, you know when it's when there's a storm going to come the next day. There's a saying: um, "Red sky at night, sailors' delight; red sky in the morning, sailors' warning." Something like that. You know how to discern those things, but you don't discern the signs of the times. And I'm going to read from Genesis one, chapter uh, verse fourteen. It's when God is is in the beginning. He's creating everything. It said. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide, divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So when you look at that, you think, yes, they're going to divide spring, summer, winter, fall and for days and years and dividing time. But if you look at the words in the Hebrew, the word signs actually means signals and the seasons are actually in Hebrew, the word is moedim, they're appointed divine appointments of God. They are for signals, they're for uh, signs in the heavens. And it's, it's interesting that Jesus pointed to the sky to explain to them that they didn't know the signs of the times. They could read the sky for other things, but not for the signs of the times, which is prophecy being fulfilled. And um, speaking of signs of the times, tonight is Passover, and uh, it falls tonight after sundown. Uh, the Jewish day starts in the evening, and in the evening and the morning were the first day. It, it starts that way. And uh, tonight, I don't know, a lot of the church has been talking about and hearing about blood moons, four blood moons, and those are lunar eclipses. And it's when the, the direct sunlight, uh, when direct sunlight is blocked by the moon, but the sun's rays light up the moon. And because it travels through the Earth's atmosphere first, it causes the moon to be red. I just sort of read that, read that, and I, I didn't know how it worked, how it, the blood became, the moon became as blood. But tonight is going to be the third one. And another thing that God has been speaking to me about is the signs in the heavens. We're living in prophetic times. We're living in the last days. It's so somebody would have to have their head stuck in the sand to not see it, or just want to on purpose deny it. And it's very interesting. And my son pointed it out this morning because I was talking to him before I left the house. He said, oh, he said, the third blood moon tonight. And the United States has just signed a deal with Iran. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that interesting? And something that actually the administration had to pass over the Congress to do. And it puts Israel in a very vulnerable position. We need to be praying for Israel. We need to be praying for the Jewish people. We need to be praying for the church. We need to be praying. And the fourth blood moon is coming up. Now, God recently showed me the four moons lined up in a row. And I remember saying, and the fourth one is in the fall. Now, these four blood moons, signs in the heavens, the signs of the times, there is a series of four. It started last year, 2014 into 2015 this year. All of them fall on the Feast of the Lord, Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Last year, Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles this year. The Feast of Tabernacles is September the 28th this year, and the, that's going to be the fourth blood moon. And that blood moon is not just going to be a blood moon. It's also a super moon, which means that it's at its closest point to the Earth. It travels around the Earth in an elliptical shape with a sort of, sort of like an egg shape, but it's going to be at its closest point on that date. And because of that, it's going to look 14% larger than it would normally look, and it's going to be right over Jerusalem. And I believe God's speaking to us. We need to know the signs of the times. And uh, we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer for Israel. We need to be in prayer for the church. And we know what's going on to the church over in the Middle East. Yesterday, another attack. Terrible, awful, horrible. We can't even imagine. I, I can't even imagine what it must be like over there for Christians. Um, I think that's about it. But the signs, the times, those divine appointments, so important. Uh, God wants us to be aware of them. We need to be sober as a church. And, um, and one other thing I noticed as I was reading the scriptures about this was that when Jesus on the cross, he gave up his spirit. He, he died on the cross, was taken down. 
some things happened that are going to happen again at his second coming. There was darkness over the earth. Again, lunar and solar eclipses. Um, there was a, a great earthquake. The earth was split. His blood was poured out. When he comes back, there will be another earthquake. There will be another split from the Mount of Olives. And the blood that's shed at that time will not be his. It's already been poured out. But it will be the blood of those who have gathered to war against him when he returns. So I just, uh, I was really excited about this morning. I was really happy. I was, I was waiting for it all week. You'd think when you have to talk, you know, you think, oh, am I going to say it right? But I was really happy. And I just know that the Spirit of God is here amongst us. And I know that he's speaking to each one of us. And I know that he's got an assignment for each one of us in these last days. And I just pray that we'll all have our hearts open to him, to hear him, and just to do his will and know oh, what our part is um, in these end times. It's always our part to preach the gospel, that's for sure. That's a given. That, that's everybody's part. But there are certain things that he's called us to do um, and to pray about. And um, I just leave the rest of this in his hands today. And I thank you. I just want to mention one more thing about these four blood moons before I leave. Um, other major events that have happened that have affected, dealt with Israel and with the church, with the world. Uh, I'm just going to mention two or three. But the formation of Israel, again in 1948, there was a series of blood moons. Uh, 1492, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, series of blood moons. 1967, Yom Kippur War, when Jerusalem was taken back by the Jewish people, by Israel, again. So God is talking through signs and, and, and in the heavens, and um, we just need to have our eyes open. And I thank God for his word, and I thank you all today. God bless you. <laughs>